Welcome to the Trauma Informed Lens Podcast. Each week, Matt, Kurt, Jerry, and the occasional special guest explore how the trauma informed paradigm challenges traditional beliefs and approaches concerning a wide variety of areas. This podcast addresses psychological trauma in an educational manner and is not designed to replace mental health treatment. If anything in this podcast makes you feel uncomfortable or anxious, please talk to a mental health professional. Welcome to episode 35 of the Trauma Informed Lens Podcast. Um, I'm back here today with uh, my good friends, Jerry and Kurt, and we are excited to try out a new format today. Uh, This is our first listener request episode, um, which yes to our audience means you can request topics for us to cover, and we may cover that topic. So uh, this comes from our our, uh, good friend, Deb, Crowell, uh, who works actually in my wife's school district, and even though she's uh, just down the road from the three of us up in Boulder Valley, uh, Jerry and I met her uh, over dinner actually um, at a uh, conf- the trauma sensitive school conference in DC. So as normal, you know, you have a neighbor, and you don't meet the neighbor uh, in your neighborhood, but you uh, find out you're sitting next to her at a restaurant in Washington DC, and, and struck up a great. Uh, conversation with her and and she's been a friend of the show um, ever since and she asked uh, I'll I'll give it a very general question then we'll break it down through the hour that that we have together is you know why do a lot of kids coming from traumatic situations that she works with and I also um, know that this um, happens with adults um, that uh, with programs I've worked with as well there's just not a whole lot of thank yous for the work that we do there's not a lot of gratitude shown um, and, and this struck me early on in my career is we really do our best and, and work our hardest to help people. And, and I, I don't think necessarily it's the thank you we're looking for, but, but sometimes we feel like there's no appreciation there um, and, and may even feel the opposite at times. And, and I think when I travel around the country, I, especially when I do self-care uh, workshops, I have people talk about their uh, they're, they're, uh, the things that burn them out or stress them out and frustrate them in their work. And um, well, gratitude doesn't necessarily make the list. The one that does, which we'll also talk today, is uh, the entitled client or patient or student. Um, uh, I, I had one person years ago say it's the gimme, 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 gimme uh, uh, folks that we work with. And I think we've all all seen that. So we're going to explore these two things throughout our time together and then see what kind of conclusions we can come up with. And as always, we uh, like to start out with our bright, shiny objects of the week, something that we're, we're thinking about, reading about. And uh, so, Kurt, let's start out with you this week. Uh, what's your bright, shiny object of the week? Um, I'm going to get probably as political as I ever get, which is that I'm, I'm noticing how um, nice it is to live in a place where we can engage in discourse about what we agree about and what we don't agree about. And I've been noticing that a lot lately. Um, certainly there's, I mean, lots of things going on politically in our country and um, I'm, I'm happy to be in a, in a place where we can talk about those things and um, we can get different perspectives on what's happening and kind of make our own decisions about what we believe and what we don't believe and what we want to make our country to be. So I'm really, I'm really grateful for that. And I've been thinking a lot about that this last week or so. Very cool. And, and it seems more and more rare too in our, our country as we get, you know, you look at some of the polls coming out, how polarized we are. Uh, I, I saw something yesterday that uh, people now, the number one reason uh, or, or commonality they, they look for in a romantic partner, whether it's like in hindsight or proactively is political affiliation, um, which is a little scary. Like, like if that's become number one, that, that's, that's, that says something about your culture. But I found that that was fascinating to see it at, at that level. Uh, but boy, I wouldn't want to watch the news with somebody who wasn't yelling at the TV in the same way I was either. So uh, I, I, I kind of get it at the same time. So uh, Jerry, what about you? What's your bright, shiny object of the week? You know, I, I think this week, um, my bright, shiny object is that, you know, as I go around and, and do trainings in schools and um, for uh, treatment providers and foster care uh, parents and adoptive, um, I, I'm, 
I'm struck by how often after my presentations, people come up um, and share their own personal stories about their traumas and um, the insights they get from the um, presentations, um, mostly about how their own um, histories is impacting their relationships, whether it be in school or whether it be as a foster parent. One is I'm, I'm really grateful that I have the opportunity to do what I do and um, help people. But I, I'm also um, really encouraged sometimes by the courage that people show to stop focusing on fixing the kids and really taking a moment and being reflective about how what's happening to them is impacting. Mm-hmm. And I think that um, that's a really important is that we, we spend so much time externally focused um, that in our, in our society, it's really hard to find places to kind of stop and just be um, aware of and, and in some ways approaching um, our, own, our own sources of pain or sources of, 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 of um, really of gratification. So I, I think that's a really important piece is really approaching these key pieces of yourself as opposed to displacing them or avoiding them. Um, and I, I'm really uh, moved sometimes when people come up and share their stories. So um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity I have to uh, be in a place to kind of touch people's lives. Very cool. Very cool. Um, I'll go with mine this week. Um, I've had the opportunity to kind of uh, experience a few uh new, at least for me, uh, healing techniques. Um, As I start to really think about and explore, um, as we've talked about on the show, what are potential uh, methods for working with folks that aren't really ready to start to verbalize their traumatic experiences? And I've been fascinated uh, with with that for several years now. And and so, and I I wrote about this in my blog, so I won't get in too much detail about it. You can go to the traumainformlens.org website and, and find the link to that. But, um, you know, I've tried Reiki. Uh, my wife got me a, a free session for, for uh, the holidays and uh, really blown away by the experience. Um, as, as I say in my blog, I canceled my massage uh, uh, membership that I had uh, because Reiki, I, I, I love it so much. So, I you know, and, and I, I talked to her this week in the blog about how this could be used to help release trauma and interesting things there. Again, I, I don't know how uh, uh, we get data around some things like this, but it's a, it's a fascinating uh, tool in our belt. And some of my uh, readers have reached out to say they've integrated Reiki into their uh, service delivery package, which I think is, is awesome. And the other one that I uh, tried a couple weeks ago was uh, a really cool biofeedback system um, that you kind of just put your hands on this sensor and it, it reads things in a pretty cool way. Um, it, it's some really neat technology out there as well, where again, you're not talking about your traumatic experiences, but you're getting feedback and you're learning to breathe and you're learning to control internal processes. And just, you know, some of these things that might be the entry into treatment for people, again, that are a little freaked out about coming to somebody called a therapist because they think we're going to make them uh, process their, their trauma um, immediately. So uh, just some cool things out there that uh, I've got to experience over the last uh, couple weeks and uh, months. And so, uh, yeah, the, the, the Reiki stuff has blown me away. And uh, I, I just, I, I, I wonder about how that could be integrated in some of our services and, and how the heck do you prove that's the best practice for folks? But, you know, it's an interesting thing to think about nevertheless. So, uh, it's been fun to experience those, uh, uh, what we, I guess, still call alternative therapies, though I think we should get a better name uh, for them as well. So uh, that's my bright, shiny object of the week. So let's dive into this topic of gratitude and entitlement. Um, so I just kind of want to throw the question, Jerry, let's go with you first on this one. Um, you know, <laughs> I know you always have something to say. Uh, <laughs> I think Kurt always has something to say in response to what you have to say. And by I'm that time, I can just ask another question. So. I think that's how we started this podcast. One I think time I'm this podcast. 
One time yes. you can kick it to me, and I'm going to say, I don't know, Jerry, what do you think? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so so I, I work this out over, you know, it, it's my facilitation. I, I think we're in the norming, you know, storming <laughs> stages a little still, but we're getting there. So, so Jerry, you know, what about folks that, that are, are struggling or, 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 you know, come from a traumatic background, um, the kids, the families you worked with? That, that sort of, in your opinion, uh, brings out, you know, the, this feeling from us uh, of sort of that, that there's a lack of gratitude there or, or a feeling of, of entitlement. Again, things that can really wear us down if we're not careful. And I just kind of want to start our exploration on this about why do you think we get confronted with sort of that energy and, and, and that, those feelings that, that manifest obviously inside ourselves, but, but there's some real reality there as well. You know, it's an, it's an interesting question and um, really having a, an internal frame of reference um, to kind of organize your experience with people like that has been helpful. And I, I don't know how accurate that model I have in my head is, but it's useful. You know, we always talk about how models aren't necessarily accurate. But for me, I try to understand what developmentally happens to people in the context of relationships that they could balance out the meeting of their own needs with a kind of openness and respect for someone else's needs, that boundary, right? And, and that occurs really in our first relationships. Um, when in a nonverbal way, somebody is paying attention to our needs, um, but we begin to understand that this person that's with us has their own needs. Um, and, and that nonverbal communication that goes on between an infant and their caregiver um, begins to create this opportunity to be feel like, you know what, my needs are going to get met. Um, and I'm also aware that this person is experiencing something, but not the same as me. Mm. Um, and I can begin to have some ability to kind of have that communication that goes back and forth. And I, and I find that people who come to relationships and are so focused on their own needs without an awareness of someone else's needs, developmentally have not had the opportunity to be in that type of relationship um, that they, one is can trust that their needs are going to get met. And two is sometimes they're even aware that somebody else is having an experience separate from their own. Um, and so really when I'm um, having, when I'm sitting with someone, having a cognitive framework allows me to sit with that individual in a compassionate way um, rather than being angry or frustrated is really understanding developmentally um, this individual is much younger than their chronological age. Mm -hmm. um, and when I'm dealing with children younger, sometimes you have to, in the relationship, teach them that they have an experience and somebody else has an experience. So it becomes part of the, the process. Um, and when I'm in that state, I'm getting in some ways self-gratified um, to be, to feel like I'm, I'm able to, to kind of be with somebody. But Really, it's a developmental process. We all start out, come into the world, and we're not aware that other people have needs. Mm -hmm. um, and in some ways, we all we want is for our needs to be met. Um, and, and through these interactions, we begin to develop that capacity. So most of the time, um, either somebody's in a state that they can't meet, hear your needs, um, if they're outside their social engagement system and they're much more defensive, they're not going to be thinking about your needs or they've never developmental had the experience of being in a relationship where their needs are being met and they're without someone else. So it's a developmental process. Awesome. Um, Kurt, what, anything to add to, to that? Yeah, I mean, I was, I was thinking on. about the complexity of uh, both kind of learning that has to happen and the the complexity of the the way that you you would have to use your frontal cortex 
to think about somebody else having an experience that's different than the one that I'm having. That's a really complicated skill. And I mean, I think all of us could give lots of examples of people who are very high functioning who miss that skill a lot. <laughs> that's a really complicated one. And so that's a pretty interesting one. And two, I was thinking about how it, it, it can be so gratifying, right? To sit and, and talk with another person and to share an experience. And we're always doing that by how we talk to each other. And so I can say, God, that was so great. I was, I was so happy in that, you know, in that moment. And Matt, you may say the same thing back to me, right? Yeah, I was really happy. But neither one of us really knows what happy feels like to the other one, what that experience really is like. So it's always in kind of an imprecise match. And we're always kind of guessing what, what is happening there. We're using some external cues to get what that is like. When you think about how early on in life when we teach children to recognize pain, right? we do it based on what we saw them experience, right? The kid crashes on the bike and they skin their knee. So we, see it, we saw something happen. We see a mark of an injury and we go, that must hurt. And so we learn then to talk about our internal state a lot around pain. Now that becomes one of the first things that we start to talk about in terms of emotional internal experience because it's easy to identify things that might hurt. Like we can all kind of do that of, of seeing an injury on another person and going, yeah, that would hurt me. I can resonate then with that experience. When we get into other emotions like gratitude and um, sadness and happiness and some of these more complicated emotional states, that gets way harder to do. Yeah. Like, you know, you could see somebody win in the lottery and go, they must be really happy. I, I got a pretty good chance of being correct about that. Uh, but there are lots of gray areas in there where we kind of go back and forth and guess. And, I, and that kind of goes into some of the attachment things that, Jerry, you were alluding to about attunement. Right? That attunement is your best guess at what that other per person is experiencing. And a, a, as we've talked about, the best parents get it wrong a lot. And it, the real difference is it, recognizing when you're misattuned and repairing it. And that's kind of a part of the, this process of, of getting kind of in tune with, with each other, being able to talk about internal states and what we're experiencing and recognizing that that person is going through something different than, than we are. Um, that's really complicated. So it's not too surprising that when there are developmental insults, that that can be a major area that um, needs a lot of intervention and a lot of real kind of specific patient teaching. Uh, to get to to have happen as complex as that is. Yeah, and one of the things I, you know that that I've I've thought a lot about over the years because again I'm I'm confronted in a lot of my trainings with with the frustration and I felt it as well with with that entitled. Uh, again, I'm I'm hopefully going to get rid of that word from from vocabularies is one of my my efforts, but that entitled client and you know I, I think especially early on in my career this just struck me that. Um, you know, I, I worked with several people, especially in housing programs and community-based programs where it was like, I may not see this individual for three months. I don't know if they're alive or dead. And then they show up, um, at least if they were on my caseload at 3.30 on a Friday when I had happy hour plans. Um, and all of a sudden they want all these resources. That's every day, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, now I want housing. I, I want food bank. I'm, I'm ready to get my kids back in. I mean, like, I want a medical appointment. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm so glad you're alive. And, and okay, I'll work over the weekend to get all this done. All you got to do is show up Monday to sign some papers and we'll get you all this. And then I don't see him again for another couple of weeks. And, and there was this, this really, there was this kind of this, uh, like I said, what, what, what somebody said, the gimme, gimme, gimme court of entitled mentality is I deserve this and you're kind of alive to meet my needs. And, and so, you know, so because I was getting this answer so much in my trainings, I really started to think deeper about this and, and going back to the neurobiology and, and what's, what's the brain sort of walking into to this meeting? And, and I really started to think about what sort of, as we've called these traits over time, what, what kind of traits do you need to survive poverty? What, what tra uh, traits do you need to survive homelessness? Or even for a child growing up in, in poverty as well. And 
Um, I think anybody that's worked in, in homelessness especially, but also I see this a lot when people are trying to manage uh, addictions as well is, um, as I like to say, uh, that the life on the streets, uh, a hustle. Um, you're doing what you need to do to get your needs met. And a lot of times, um, other people become a way to get those needs met. So if I'm um, struggling with an addiction, um, a lot of people in my life come about me trying to get high so I don't feel withdrawals. Um, it becomes a very immediate reaction. Um, uh, a lot of examples I hear and I've seen it myself is that for some reason, maybe a tax something or a little bit of inheritance. But if somebody that's living on the street uh, comes into $1,000, let's say, and they have $1,000 in their pocket, and we're all excited, hey, this could pay three months rent, this, that, and the other. Um, too often what we find is they blow that $1,000 all within the next 24 hours. Um, there's not putting things on layaway. There's not opening a bank account. But there's, there's this mixture of immediacy and really using everything in your environment just to survive and meet your basic needs. And so I thought what I really started to think about is that's the, uh, the traits of the, the neurobiology is hardwired to really survive. So when they come into our office, again, looking to meet their basic needs, you know, they, they may not be empathetic towards us. They not, might not be caring so much about our internal states they're really there to try to get their needs met because that's what allowed them um, to survive on the street. So, so I've really tried to drop that word entitled. Yeah, there, there can be a behavior that we might, might feel entitled to us, but we have to, I think, be really careful about internalizing that, that this client or this student or this person's entitled because that's what they've used to really survive um, their life up to that point. And so, again, Jerry, as you always talk about those states and traits, that, that's given me a really good way to think about that as well. You know, you know I, I, I think the question that you have to ask yourself is, what's my role in this person's life, right? Because um, as... An individual interacting with a, an ind somebody who's into their own survival, I'm biologically designed to either want to fight with you or get away from you, mm -hmm. right? So, so that individual is not going to elicit from me a sense of wanting to, to be attentive, attuned, and responsive to that person's needs either. When I'm in the role of, say, a a parent, or I'm in the role of a therapist, or I'm in the role of a teacher, or I'm in the role of a case manager, um, I have to, in some ways, be able to use my um, really bottom-up kind of to understand and experience this, but then use top-down skills to be able to stay involved and, and stay in, in an open state and curious state. So, in a way, that takes a lot of energy and, and to be able to use, like our, you know, our frontal cortex is an amazing um, structure in our, in our biology, but it's very metabolically costly. So in order to stay engaged in an open and curious way, I have to be able to, in some ways, regulate my my impulse to avoid and, and distance myself and stay engaged with that individual. I think parenting is really biologically very costly. Yeah. And the only thing that allows us to continue to do that is that we get these other chemicals that get kind of activated in us as oxytocin and dopamine to kind of give us rewards for staying engaged. Mm -hmm right, to kind of look at that. Sometimes in these jobs that we have, um, we don't really get those rewards, those by, right? Yeah. So we're, we're staying engaged, but, and we're using all of our metabolically and our, our resources, but we're not getting an M&M, &M. we're not getting this kind of dopamine kind of way, unless we have some type of personal mission or um, reason to be in that place that, or some kind of internal dialogue that says this 
relationship is in line with my personal values and beliefs about what I want to do in the world, right? I have to have, then all of a sudden I start to get some dopamine rewards out of being with this individual. But if I don't have that guiding internal beliefs, I'm going to end up going and I'm going to go up and eat some salty or sweet foods to kind of make up after I eat with this person, or I'm going to in some ways go get angry at somebody else. So really having these cognitive models and, and knowing that I'm doing something in line with what I truly believe is the best to make the world a better place. Uh, you know, you always talk about your social justice mission, Matt, to kind of look at the, those are the things that allow us to stay engaged with individuals who are in, in some ways engaged in a, in a reciprocal relationship. Um, that I believe that I'm, I'm doing something personally to make, to meet my own kind of goals and, and um, kind of outcomes that I want to want to do. So I think the word entitled um, really is a devaluing mm -hmm. of that individual. And more so, I think we want to focus on what is the kind of person I want to be and why do I stay engaged with this individual who's not giving me any, is I have a mission, right? As a therapist, I want to help people. As a teacher, I want to educate people. As a case manager, I want to make sure I can resource this person and, and in some ways, whatever that mission is, that's where we should be getting those rewards from um, to kind of look at, at some of that because we're not getting the same in a, in a relationship with our, I say our child, that we're biologically designed to get all those goodies to kind of do it. These relationships don't necessarily automatically give us that. Wow. So, so, so Kurt, let, let, me, let me just say, Kurt, this is what popped in my mind, and then I'll throw it to you, is Kurt's new office for his employees would have a little thing of M&Ms that every time they're empathetic, <laughs> Come in and they, get they some would get an M&M. So I just have to, I have to put that out. to push the lever. Like, push a lever. I know, like there's just, yeah, there's a lever. So when they're empathetic, when they do a reflective statement, an m and M pops into their desk. So yeah. I just Leave had to it. share, Kurt, that, that's what popped into my head. Leave it to the therapist type to oversimplify behavior analysis. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want it to pop into my head, Kurt, but, but I have to be honest with our, our listeners. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But I did, I, yeah, well, 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 that was a little humorous to, to have that. <laughs> I, I'd love to get because because I think what Jerry says too is it's a lot of this is about us uh, and he gave us a lot of uh, reward language there so I'd love to get your I think yeah. there's some genius in what the man just said so what's, <laughs> what's your thoughts there on that I have kind of a a little analogy that I use a lot with this process right I mean I mean one of the, one of the ways that some people have talked about this process that Jerry was describing is that it requires emotional labor that is the work that we're doing. It's emotional. Uh, there is a, uh, even a, um, uh, what's the word that people have used it. We're talking about service, you know, service industries, like at the fast food restaurant, right? You got to put on a smile and say, what can I get for you today? Yeah. Even Customer if you don't feel service. like putting on yeah. a smile and saying, what do you, what can I get for you today? So there's a, there's a part of that that is a part of this kind of work, right? There is a, there's a, a process of, I think when we think about the cortex, a couple of, uh, kind of key skills there are the ideas of inhibition, which Jerry, you, you mentioned, right? There's a part of that that you have to do a lot of top-down kind of regulating your, your emotional states and recognizing what they are. And then there's another part of it that is reappraisal, which is an important part of what the cortex can do, which can take an event and put it into a framework. And so we can, that's, that's the process of, in, in the psychology world, you call it reframing. All right, so when you think about what that requires on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, I think about it like kind of like flying an airplane. Right? And when you're flying an airplane, there's a flight computer that is making tiny adjustments to the flaps on the wing at any given moment in time based on the wind that's coming over it. And if you're sitting across the table from somebody who's giving you all of this wind, so to speak, and you've got to constantly reappraise what's happening and keep making these little adjustments in oh, that's how I can understand what this person is doing, or oh, that's, I can think about this developmentally, or I can think about this from an attachment perspective, or I can think about what my role is with this person. And you're making those tiny adjustments 
all the time, which requires a lot of metabolic energy and a lot of emotional energy, and that can get really tiring. So it's a quick trip into self-care, right, from the discussion, you know. Um, But two, I think about uh, another kind of example here, um, which was years ago when um, I got the experience of being able to to get a, a, a new kind of learning experience, which is when I had to be uh, start to be in charge of a short-term stabilization program as opposed to more long-term care. And the difference between the experience of people working in those two types of programs was really pretty important, I think, for me to be able to reframe for all of them. And, and Jerry helped me a lot with this, actually. And one of the things we used to say is that the, the clinicians and the staff who worked on this short-term stabilization unit would often come from <clears throat> having worked in a more long-term care setting, and they would then transfer over into this other uh, short-term care program. And one of the things they would say that they felt a loss of was they felt like they didn't get the connection with people. And so they were kind of like, I'm not getting fed, essentially. I'm not getting the little carrots, the little M&Ms of the work every single day, because it was kind of like three days in, you're out, you know, maybe six days, you're out. And I used an analogy with them about the difference between an emergency room doctor and a primary care doctor. And so the, an, an emergency room doctor may have wonderful bedside manner, but we'll never hear about it from a patient. The primary care doctor will hear about this wonderful ER doctor who had wonderful bedside manner, right? That the ER doctor never gets that feedback. And so they had to really look at where their, where their feed or where their reward came from. And the team became so much more important to that group Mm -hmm. as opposed to necessarily getting a little bit more of your reward from um, patient interaction. And that was an important shift for them to kind of do a little reappraisal of you know, what is my work and what is my role and make those minute shifts when they're talking with somebody who's in acute in an acute phase and really needs some stabilization. It's different work than somebody who's going to be with you for nine months or a year. And, you know, it's very different the way that, that you may interact with them. So that's, an, I think, an important, that's a model that I use. I don't know how accurate it is, yeah. but it's useful to me to always be thinking about how am I kind of adjusting the flaps on my wings to make sure that I stay flying straight with this person. So, uh, so given, given that really good analogy, what would happen to an individual who lived in a world that that's the way it always was, where people came in and out of your life and, did, you know, that there was not consistency and predictability and you really weren't getting your needs met from the relationships. You, what would that eventually begin to look like? I think it would begin to look like the clients were calling entitled. Yeah, absolutely. Right? So I, I think when we look at ourselves and how we try, we struggle with this when we do it for a short amount of time, and we have to struggle to find out where we're going to get our needs met. Hopefully we develop a healthy kind of team and structures around us to kind of support us. But our clients come from worlds in which they don't have that. Yeah. So they come in yeah. not thinking they're going to get anything out of this relationship. Right. Yeah. Like, right. Yeah. To kind of, so I, I think your point, Matt, is to kind of reframe that from an entitlement to they live in a world in which they live on a short-term stabilization world, exactly. yeah. right? They come in and they get something and then they leave. They come in and they get right. something and leave. They, got, yeah. they don't have that stability where they develop those long-term feedback mechanisms that allow them. And they probably grew up in those kind of chaotic, unstable environments that didn't allow them to have those experiences that people on long-term programs say, oh, this is so great. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, and, and I, I think about if, and, and I love the model, uh, our, some, some of our folks up in Fort Collins, uh, there, there's sort of a model in homelessness where you, you take people from the community and you sleep out on the street at night just to kind of get that experience. And I think that that's meaningful. They had this really great insight um, up there too, is that we're not just going to sleep on the street during the night, but then we're going to wake up the next day and we're going to walk you through a day of what it's like to experience homelessness, including managing l- your life in the system. Um, 
And so often, whether it's in an emergency room, and, and emergency rooms are emergency rooms. They're not a place to get primary care, but oftentimes they're a place where uh, people seek primary care. A a or, or social security office, um, or you know, whatever uh, office you're going to. And a lot of these folks haven't been treated really well. I, I had the experience early on in my career where basically the agency I was working for was shutting down, so I had to go in and file for unemployment. I wasn't really treated like a human being. Like, you know, I was treated like, man, there's something wrong with me. And it's like, no, you should really go visit my agency. It's a train wreck. But, you know, it, it's just I felt so dehumanized through that experience um, that, that if, if that's your experience the majority of time in the systems, they're not going to come in and, and just be with a smile on their face and, and start giving us presents um, in, in, you know, as soon as we help them get one resource. And uh, so I think there's this reinforcement and then our systems – um, at the worst, can abuse and traumatize people. Um, they're just, in some ways, trying to get their uh, basic needs meet without maybe the the intellectual energy to manage the complexity of these systems as well. And so, uh, so Matt, uh, really, you know, going back to Deb's question about why we're actually talking about this, yeah, is validating. It's really hard dealing with people who don't respond and yeah. give you hatred, right? <laughs> and there, one way is to develop an understanding and having a compassionate understanding yes. of that, right? So that's one. The other way I think Kurt talked about is developing a team approach that the team begins to meet some of your needs and kind of do it as opposed to the clients. Um, you know, I, I think that self-care, all those things you do to reinforce and develop those um, internal structures that you need to be able and resource yourself to be able to. But really dealing with a population of people whose experience of the world is that I come in and really your job really is to just meet my needs. Mm -hmm. that's, who they, that's how they see us, right? To kind of look at that. And that's because of the experiences they've had both in their world, but also in the system. Yes. So how do we not get organized by that and eventually become who they believe we are? Yeah, right? absolutely. That's really the challenge that I think um, lots of young professionals um, face is that when you deal with individuals for a, very, for a long time, you're at risk of getting organized by their experiencing and then just dealing with those individuals as objects and providing services. Yep. Absolutely. So how do we take care of ourselves and not in some ways, some ways say, well, you know what, it's our job just to kind of do this. So then we do really, then we just become a dispenser of services. And how do we then um, go back and, and what popped into my mind is kind of Harry, um, uh, Maslow, uh, not, not Maslow's, um, Harlow's studies is that given two wired monkeys, one that has, you know, the milk and, and, and nurturing and one that is a terry cloth um, monkey, yeah. right? People would go over to, the, to get fed by the terry, but really what they wanted contact comfort, mm -hmm. right? They really wanted contact comfort. And if we look at that model, both for um, our clients, but also for us, is sometimes dealing with our clients is like that wire monkey, yeah. right? We kind of, we, we meet them, we get our needs, but we've got to find some place in our life set to find the terry cloth monkey. Where do we go and meet our own needs if it's not with this kind of service providers? We do that by having clear values and missions that we're living out. We have our own quality of relationships. We feel like we're learning and growing um, as professionals and kind of doing it. We have good, we go and we get Reiki sessions to kind of meet our own needs, whatever we're doing. But we've got to find that Terry Cloth monkey in our lives and, and understand sometimes our clients are going to be that wire monkey. Yeah, 
That's that is a great analogy. <laughs> and, and I hate that study. Those pictures just give me nice. <laughs> it's like, why do we do this to monkeys? But but anyway, <laughs> let, let me let me throw something at you, Kurt. Um, now Matt's get, getting on the social justice. I know, I know, I know, I know. Like, don't get a vegan talking about animal studies. It's not, it's well, you know, I got you know one more one more kind of point to put on to yeah. to, to this the kind of vein of what we're talking about too is that there is an important parallel process that happens here too, right? That, that the direct line staff who are dealing with, um, you know, being service dispensers, right? They start needing a lot of things and they go to the next level above them to get their needs met. And how many times as a leader in an organization do you hear people talking about the staff are entitled? Mm -hmm. There's an important reframe there that needs to be talked about as yeah. well, I think. Um, and it, and I mean, certainly, it does, there, we all know that we can't give everybody everything. There just isn't enough money to do all of those things, right? There is, isn't enough. But reframing it in a way that where we don't devalue that people have needs and that they may be expressing them to us is, I think, an important part of, of being a, a trauma-informed leader. So, so in, in my, my vision of Kurt's new office for his staff, there might be an M&M dispenser, Sometimes but he would also be there giving them hugs as well. So <laughs> I'd love to just see him break into a session. Well, I'm, a hug. I'm a hugger. I'm a hugger. Kurt, let me ask you too, because I do want to focus, because, because I think Deb's question um, is an important one, and I think we hit a, a really good piece of it with our own perceptions around this. But, but there is, in my mind, when I was thinking about this topic, that, that a lot of the folks, whether we hit them as, as children or whether we hit the, you know, we start to work with them as adults, whenever they enter our, our services in their lifespan, um, gratitude is an important skill in a lot of ways. Um, because if you take that, you know, the, the mindsets that we've been talking about that sometimes burn us out, if, if you do that in an employment setting, you're not going to be a, a necessarily a great uh, employee. Um, that, that, that the lack of gratitude, if we look at gratitude, and my, my question to you, Kurt, is, is gratitude a learned behavior? And if it is, I, I think it's an important one. And how would we help people develop that if it's an important skill um, for the environments we want them to succeed on? Um, whether that's later on in life for children or whether that's when they maybe transition out of the streets or poverty into a more stable and hopefully an employment sort of situation. So sort of gratitude as a learned behavior. I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking through kind of how to approach it because there are lots of different angles to approach this from, right? And um, certainly there are there are a couple of ways that we talk about gratitude, right? One way we can talk about gratitude is as, as an, an internal state. Mm -hmm. right? It can be a feeling that we have, right? And the other way we talk about gratitude is how we show and express that we have this internal state. Um, whether or not those two match up, we don't ever really know very well, right? I may, I may express gratitude really, really well, and in my head I may be thinking, <laughs> yeah, go jump in a lake, right? I can do that, right? <laughs> so there there is at times a confusion between whether or not those two things have to match up to make a difference. And one of the things that we kind of pull out of, out of dialectical behavior therapy is that they don't always have to be that way. And sometimes even engaging in behavior can generate the correlative feeling or the correlative internal state, right? So smiling can change your internal state. Engaging in something that is very, very behavioral can change your internal state. And so one of the things that we have learned both with social um, reciprocity is that the expression of gratitude is one of the top skills that you can teach somebody that opens up social worlds to another person. In the behavioral language, we call those behavioral cusps or pivotal responses, really critical skills that and you learn how to express gratitude, even if you don't feel it, it can go a long way towards opening up new social um, worlds to you, new social relationships to you. As a kind of looking back story, one of the things that I used to systematically teach adolescents uh, with uh, autism spectrum disorder uh, who would come to the unit that I worked on was just to be able to say, even when they got told that they couldn't do something or a limit got set, 
I would teach them to, to even fake it and say, thanks for letting me know. I, that changed the relationship and the interaction with that, that staff person sitting across from them, right? They were used to not getting a thank you for me, you know, for setting a limit. But to get that really started to fundamentally change the way that they interacted with each other. And over time, some kids would get it. Some kids would be like, oh, I really am glad that they told me that. Some were like, I always have to fake it. And I'm like, all right, good enough. You know, that, that still can open up social worlds to you. So there are two sides of that, right? There is the internal state side, and then there is also the skill of expressing gratitude. Um, they, if they match up, it's great. I mean, that's a great experience to have and a great experience to share with other people. Uh, they don't always have to, and it can still become a really important skill uh, that can help uh, people to, to really have good social relationships. Great. Jerry, what, what are your thoughts on this? How we can help people d develop gratitude appreciation, again, as a as sort of a, a functional, tangible skill that will hopefully help them succeed in other environments um, as well? You know, what came to my mind is uh, Richie Davidson's work looking at um, kind of uh, right brain kind of managing uncomfortable states, um, avoidance, and more left brain of kind of approach and happiness and kind of right. And that um, another really bright guy I know is talked about um, cups that are half full and half empty, um, Matt. But um, Using, using our, the part of our brain that um, allows us to approach experiences um, it, it is that um, we have the ability to intentionally create our own reactions to things, right? Top-down kind of ways to kind of do it. We have also bottom-up reactions to environment and both internal and external environments. Right, so this this ability to kind of um, approach things with gratitude, really, if you kind of think, and I and I I don't know, it's kind of a, a simplistic way to look at right brain, left brain, kind of look at, but really, what you're doing is you're um, intentionally utilizing certain circuitry that allows you to approach the world as opposed to trying to manage the world and, 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 and avoid it. And I, and I think that um, Kirk's point about, is it an internal state or is it just a skill that you're using socially? In either way, you're approaching something, right? As I, I, I'm, I'm seeing something in the world that I'm, I'm choosing to see something more positive about it rather than negative. When I, when I see something negative, I'm actually activating very different neural networks and actually triggering very different biochemicals that are happening in my body. When I'm seeing something from a positive perspective, having gratitude, I'm creating more reward centers. I'm, I'm much more gearing towards approaching something to kind of look at that. So I, I, I think that, um, and when we do that, we know from this concept of neuroplasticity that the more we do, we do approach problems from a particular, even if we're doing it at, um, in some ways that our internal states aren't matching up yet, the more we do that, we're strengthening neural networks that are allowing us to do that in the future. Where if we're finding threat cues or things that are wrong, we're activating those networks and strengthening those networks. So gratitude is not only a social um, interaction, but it actually is changing the, our neurochemistry that we're sending powerful um, repetitive neural activations that are strengthening networks that allow us to begin to be in the world in a different way. Um, so I, I think there's enough research that when we practice gratitude, um, it's, it's, it's a social skill, but it's also building in neural networks that allow us to begin to see the world in a way that those are, those are the issues that are going to come to the foreground. If we build our neural networks to in some ways be defensive and, and, and more kind of avoidant or reactive, 
our stress networks are going to be activated and they'll be strengthened. And so through these kind of interactions, which is, which is one of the things that Daniel Siegel talks a lot about is our mind uses our brain to kind of activate itself as opposed to just being responsive to our, our nervous system and where we're going. We intentionally can create certain states in ourselves by how we choose to, in some ways, respond. And even if we're doing it as if, practicing those skills, we're actually beginning to build in those new tracks in our brain that eventually those skills actually have a better chance of having our, our, our basic social, what we're seeing socially, match up with an internal state. Mm -hmm. um, it may not at first, but through practice, we begin to see that there's more of a congruency between those things. So yeah. I think you know, you're, you're right, Kurt, that sometimes we just are saying those words. But the more we say those words, the more we do it, we're actually activating certain neural networks right. and strengthen it and we can begin to, to do it. But we can also do it the other way. We can find things wrong. We can see things that we don't have. We can see something wrong with our clients or wrong, and we begin to activate very different neural networks that become strengthened. So that's the beauty of, uh, of us being who we are is we have the ability to intentionally direct our attention where we want it to be. Um, and how we direct our attention really creates internal activation of very different networks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it reminds me of a, a, fa a study I'm just fascinated because it seems like such a small thing to do for, for the outcomes that it's, it's showing. And that's, that's the, and it's almost embarrassing to say it out loud because it doesn't seem like a real study, but um, sending those three kind of positive things or, or sharing three positive things that happen in, in your day. Um, and again, we'd have to adjust this uh, for folks. I mean, students, it's pretty easy because it could be after the end of the school day, but they, they, they had people like do this and one group did it, one group didn't do it. And you saw things like blood pressure, overall health, happiness measures, all improve in the group that just spent a couple minutes at the end of their work day uh, communicating to somebody um, three positive things that, that happened during their day. And the really cool thing about this study is that when they stopped the study and when the uh, experimental group or the group that was sending the three positives stopped doing it, their outcomes continue to be better six months and a year out um, just from those expressions of gratitude. So, <laughs> I, you know, I, I think some of this is just giving opportunity uh, uh, for people to, to kind of just say, hey, what, what's gone good since the last time I've seen you? And hopefully they can come up with something um, along those lines. And if you know your clients well enough and patients to know and students whether that's a good thing to do or not, but you know, that study just always sits with me is those little expressions, as both of you said, can actually turn in eventually to creating internal states um, where they're able to appreciate uh, not only what we're trying to help them with, but again, translating that into other environments as well. And, and, and you know, the, the, the research kind of, and I can't cite the study, but looks at your friends of friends. When you're positive and happy, not only does it impact the people around you, but it impacts the people that hang around with them, right? And so if you think about an organization and you think about that the clients are coming in and in a place where they feel like they're just getting their needs met, there's a, there's a tendency to push that environment towards hyperarousal, towards kind of seeing what's wrong. If we have an attitude of gratitude, we can actually begin to counteract that in our environment, mm -hmm. create an environment where the people I supervise feel more resourced, the people they interact feel more. So we can begin to create an environment that's really a healthier relational environment that people begin to see the world as a place where there's opportunities and rewards as opposed to where there's lack of abundance and 
I need to figure out how to kind of manipulate to get my needs met. So how we bring ourselves to work has a lot to do with um, not only with your clients, but with the individuals that are surrounding you that you're working with to kind of look at that. Absolutely. And, and that's, a, that's an amazing, uh, we didn't talk about this before, but an amazing lead in to um, our next episode where, where I want to talk about those social networks. And as Jerry mentioned, there's a lot of really cool re- uh, research out there um, about how not only are our emotional states or there are clients' emotional states impacted by interactions just with the individuals they're experiencing, but we can measure this out to friends, friends, and friends, friends, friends. Um, and, and I think that there's not only a really powerful message around uh, social networks with our own self-care, but also when we think about uh, behavioral change as well, because we know that not only emotions are contagious, but also behavior. So I think that's a great way to, to kind of transition our episode of, you know, thinking about if you express gratitude, that will also be contagious. And again, hopefully we gave you some ways to think about, you know, rethink the word entitled um, and also help people understand that if, if we express gratitude, in some ways we're teaching them how to express that in their own life as well. So, um, I w- so stay tuned um, for the next episode. Next week, we'll talk about those social network research and the contagion of emotions and behaviors um, and some of that really cool research next week. Um, I'd also so like to... You. Let's thank Deb for bringing uh, that uh, to us question. and uh, with, a great with question. really gratitude for her both listening and uh, giving us uh, some feedback on things that she would like us to talk about. Absolutely. We love you, Deb. And again, we're, we're opening the can of worms up that if you have a topic suggestion, uh, you can go to traumainformlens.org. Uh, drop it in the comments. We read and I share all those comments uh, uh, with, with between the three of us and we love to get them so you can go there also I, I keep an eye on YouTube and everywhere else that uh, we're kind of at as well so <laughs> I, I've lost track of everything but it's fun to get uh, uh, people in Connecticut people in the UK uh, who send me hey, I listen to your podcast on the way to work we love that stuff that uh, that gives us that little M&M that pops up in Kurt's office uh, <laughs> to reward me for being uh, empathetic so uh, I need that hug, though, Kurt. I need the hug, too. So I'm a hugger. I know you are. Uh, so, so I want to thank our audience for joining us again. Great episode, fellas. I learned a lot here. And, uh, I, you know, I, I love these because, yeah, gratitude is an issue. Entitlement's an issue. But, boy, it's fun to dig deeper in these concepts. And, again, uh, our gratitude and appreciation to Deb for uh, uh, being the listener that sent us this question in as well. And so, like I said, you can find resources, links, videos, everything else at traumainformlens.org. And uh, we will see you next week where we'll talk about the contagion, the (laughs) contagious nature of emotions, behaviors, and this really cool research around social networks. So uh, uh, have a great week, and uh, we'll, we'll see you next episode. Thank you, guys. Thank you.